This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers brought to you by the Fur Bearers. My winter hiatus is over, and we're back, just in time to kick off with a conversation about legislation that could help make fur history in Canada. Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, the Liberal MP for Beaches East York, in February introduced Private Members Bill C-247, an act to prohibit fur farming. This act, if passed through both the House of Commons, Senate, and if it receives royal assent, would end commercial fur farming in Canada at the federal level. MP Erskine Smith joined Defender Radio to discuss the bill, how private members' bills work, what people can do to support it, and what other ways communities can engage on the issue at a federal level. To get started, why don't we talk a bit about C-247, uh, the bill to prohibit fur farming that was introduced in February. Uh, could you just outline what the bill actually says and what it would do should it go through the process, receive royal assent, and become law? Sure. So the bill very simply seeks to prohibit commercial fur farming in Canada and stipulates effectively grandfathers the uh, exist the existing fur farm operations to say they can continue until such time as they no longer have mink that they would breed further. And so the existing mink or foxes that they might have at their facility can be used after that. The operation would wind down and the minister may compensate these businesses as they go out of business. And the idea there is I effectively cribbed from what happened over 20 years ago in the UK where they prohibited fur farming, commercial fur farming, and they allowed a a buyout effectively of the businesses that were in the business of fur farming. It makes sense as an opportunity to not just say your, your, you know, professional life is over, good luck, but to say, we collectively as a society don't want this activity to go on any further. And we are going to do our best to make sure that you receive the least possible impact from it. Uh, That's the impression I get from a lot of folks who have talked about why we would transition people out that way as opposed to just maybe drop a hammer. But as you note, that comes down to the the folks at the very top levels of governments who are going to meet in consultation, I imagine, with a whole bunch of lawyers, too. It's a conversation around compensation that would have to happen via the executive. So in my role, and this is the arcane nature of private members business, but I can set all sorts of rules and I can try to pass all sorts of rules via legislation, but I can't spend money and I can't tax. And so the monetary expenditure, it would ultimately be a decision of the government. And that would be in consultation with industry. It's, It's not dissimilar at times when you look at any number of industries that are wound down or are disrupted in different ways. In this case, this industry should no longer exist. And we can go through the reasons why, but for animal welfare reasons, which are, I think, exceedingly obvious, but also as we live through a pandemic for human health reasons that the the hugely unnecessary fashion accessory that is fur is imposing great costs when you look at the fact that mink specifically but but other you know raccoon foxes and otherwise that when i read the recent research around how this pandemic likely originated likely originated from a live animal market in wuhan and specifically from the section of that market with live raccoon foxes and so when i think of fur farming and the risks and the fact that a disease like covid can be transmitted from humans to animals like mink and then back to humans and the risk of variants. You, you look at it from just even bracketing the animal welfare issues, which I care a lot about, but even bracketing those off the table entirely, it's still eminently obvious that we should be phasing out these practices, which is why we see BC having done so recently for the sake of human health. Yep. And in B.C., they are still trying to get a complete handle on the situation from what I understand. And I'm not going to get into detail on that because I currently don't have the detail. But the actual issue of COVID and mink farms has not ended just because of that policy, too. That's the other thing I think worth noting. So it is a constant battle in terms of trying to manage this virus. And as we've seen with a human population, any number of tiny variables 
can just cartwheel it into different areas or different issues. And I think that's what has been so frightening about this experience for the last couple of years is the constant updates and news and changes that are difficult, e even if you understand the science fully, I think, to rationalize and hang on to. So a One Health approach to this issue, which is what we're hearing at a lot of different levels internationally, does seem quite logical at this point. I think that's a great way of framing the conversation because this idea of a one health approach, this idea that human health, animal health, environmental health are all interconnected. We, we know that to be true. The evidence is increasingly overwhelming that it is true. And the factory farming, this industrial commercial fur farming is a small example of what a one health approach should be addressing. And we are putting ourselves, as I say, ourselves at risk. This is obviously the filthy, confined conditions, the horrible conditions that we're putting animals through. One would think for an unnecessary fashion item, one would think that would be sufficient to, to address. But when you layer on the fact that this is adding variant risk to a pandemic that has cost thousands of lives, tens of thousands of lives in Canada, not to mention the economic toll, I. I look at it and I throw up my hands and say, well, obviously this is something we should do. And this shouldn't be a question of when, it shouldn't be a question of whether we do it. It should be a, let's go off and do it and let's do it now. And the act, if passed, would basically stipulate it comes into a force a year after it re receives royal assent, the year being you've got one year to get your shit together. Mm -hmm. And the government can compensate, probably ought to compensate to make sure the politics are as smooth as possible and to make sure we fairly transition people into and farmers into other uh, uh, business practices. But at its core, should this practice continue to exist? I think the answer is obviously no. And there are many other jurisdictions around the world that have already gotten to this place, as I mentioned, the UK a long time ago. And we don't have a massive industry in Canada. So why would we be seeking to protect something that is so harmful to animals and present such incredible risk to human health? Absolutely. And one of the things that came up, we did some survey work uh, right around the time C247 received its first reading and found that 74% of Canadians support ending fur farming nationally. And I've looked at a lot of these polls. I know you've looked at a lot of these types of polls. How often do you see the number 74% approving of something that's a, a relatively political or economic type situation. Like, it's not a very, you know, do you prefer the Maple Leafs or the Canadians? It's a, a broad kind of situation. We would not see a 74% level of support for most initiatives that we pursue yeah. and pursue quite actively. And in a case like this, it's also interesting because I guarantee that that support comes from across party lines. It Whereas does. you see oftentimes on various issues. Oh, it might be a large majority of Canadians, but the conservative members are very opposed to the particular policy. And we, we can see that with climate policies, right? Yep. Where, yes, the members of the Green Party, the NDP, the Liberal Party, the Bloc are all supportive of these policies, but the members of the Conservatives balk at the policies a little bit. But on animal welfare, on, a, on an issue of animal welfare like this, the cross-partisan nature of the support is quite interesting too. Yeah, and the survey results definitely showed that, uh, again, in the demos where we expect it to be lower, it was still a majority for, you know, uh, men in Nova Scotia or Quebec. Like, it's still high in all of those categories we expect it to be low in. So for me, that was a that was a revelation almost of, wow, like this, this actually people nationally genuinely support moving forward with something like this, which is exciting in itself. And that leads to how people can kind of get behind it, because a private member's bill is not a sure thing. Um, it doesn't, even though you are with the ruling party uh, or who the party whom has control, I'm not sure of my Queen's English there, um, but it doesn't mean that it's just going to get pushed through the way other party-based legislation might. So what are things people can be doing to suggest to their MP that they'd like to see this go through or other things they might be able to do? So two things to say. Mm -hmm. One is that there's no guarantee private members legislation passes. I have a reasonably high number on the order paper as far as it goes. I'm number 41. We go in slot tranches of 30 basically that get replenished by 15. So we're through the first 30. I'm likely to have the first hour of debate of the legislation that I move forward with. 
uh, sometime in June, maybe possibly September, but, but mm -hmm. possibly sometime in June and it moves quite slowly through the process. And so what private members business is best at, and I have a, a few different initiatives that I've introduced since I started in politics back in 2015, but they can really push the government towards an issue. And so whether it was the Modernizing Animal Protections Act that I introduced that pushed animal welfare onto the government's agenda in a serious way. We have animal welfare issues in our last platform in the mandate letters for the first time since I've been in politics for the first time ever, actually, I think, from the Liberal Party's perspective. We have legislation around addressing drug use as a health issue because of legislation that I've tabled around privacy protections because of legislation that I've tabled. And so you can really make a difference pushing issues onto the government's agenda via private members bills, but you only see that success if Canadians raise their voices, which gets to the second point. Canadians should be writing to their members of parliament. They should be calling up their members of parliament's offices and asking for a meeting with themselves, but also with their neighbors and friends in the riding. And really, I would emphasize, build a relationship with that office, with the staff in that office, with the member of parliament. And educate the member of parliament about why this issue matters, educate them about the health risks, health, educate them about what's happening in BC, because I guarantee colleagues in Ontario don't know what's happening in BC yep. necessarily. Educate them about the need for national legislation, that this isn't good enough to have one province take a leadership role and the other provinces wait and and, and frankly do nothing, that this is a really, there, there's a, a possibility here and an opportunity here for national leadership on an issue like this and to pick up on what BC's done and make sure that there's a national standard at play. And I think that's crucially important as well. And it's possible that, you know, agricultural practices, there's concurrent jurisdictions between federal and provincial governments. We can make this happen at the federal level uh, via the legislation that I propose. And at the most fundamental level, get a commitment from the member of parliament, one, one would hope, to mm -hmm. support legislation like this and then to be vocal in that support with the agricultural minister, with the prime minister's office, and to make sure we, we, we see that momentum translate into government action down the road. Yeah, and I think it's great to reach out in a lot of ways, too. We always use our one-click letter, and that can be a very effective tool. I actually, this morning, uh, we are recording this the day it's being released, and this morning heard from my MP in Hamilton East in response to my one-click letter saying, I am going to support this because of the reasons stated in your letter. Um, so that's, and that was from my personal account, so this is way off to the side, no connection there. So it makes me feel good both about the letter I wrote and about the fact that this MP has now learned about the issue and is going to support it. And again, as you said, whether that means this specific bill goes through or they're now on board with it in general, it's positive, I think. It's a positive conclusion to that conversation. What comes next is in a degree up to circumstance and fate, I think. Uh, and we'll all work hard to push it. And actions in Parliament in the course of the work we do alongside one another through our animal welfare caucus, for example. So mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. In the lead up to the last election, we had a number of people who had written in to call for a uh, prohibition on the live export of slaughter of horses. Yep. Uh, insanely cruel the way these animals are transported. We had animal science experts come and testify to our animal welfare caucus to say, there is no way that this can be done in a humane way and it should be uh, put, it should be ended. And we had hundreds of thousands of Canadians that signed a petition to ban cosmetic testing on animals. Mm -hmm. We had Murray Sinclair, former senator, introduce the Jane Goodall Act uh, to better protect animals in captivity. There was a lot of work that had been put in to advocacy efforts in certainly the time that I've been doing this. Mm -hmm. And that was on top of the Modernizing, Modernizing Animal Protections Act work where we did see some changes around the prohibition on shark finning and, and better protecting animals via the criminal code. And so we saw these issues brought to the fore by people writing to their MPs, just as you say, one click letters, signing petitions, calling their offices, having meetings yep. via Zoom, in person, all of that advocacy. And as a result of that, when we convened as an animal welfare caucus, we pushed to have certain issues included in the platform. And the issues that were top of mind for us in many ways were the ones that were driven into our offices by constituents and Canadians. And so when we look at this particular issue, the idea, you might hear the siren in the background. Oh, that's all right. It makes it exciting. <laughs> well, MP you, on, on this, the run doing an interview. <laughs> yeah, that's right, on the lamp. But uh, on this particular issue, 
private members legislation is one route. And, and look, mm -hmm. there will be private members legislation in this parliament, including mine, on animal issues. And I hope we see those through. But at a minimum, what these private members bills do and what the advocacy that Canadians do in support of them, they add these issues to the agenda for the next go around, put them onto the government's agenda and make sure that in the end, they become government legislation such that there's a certainty that they will pass. And I think it definitely shows that it shows all people who watch what comes forward and what gets reacted to that, again, if, if collectively we give C247 that solid push, we all do our part to connect with an MP, to talk about it with friends and neighbors and to ask for it to be implemented, then we do see, uh, you know, the MP off to the side that may typically not want to support something like this realize, hey, you know, my constituents, despite the fact that this isn't my ideal, this is something they're interested in and could get me a few votes next time or it's genuinely what the community wants despite the fact that i don't understand it and that can be a very powerful starting point for a lot of change yeah or even i didn't know enough about it yeah i hadn't turned my mind to it and then i had five constituents reach out i had 20 constituents reach out the advantage of one click letters frankly is when you get volume to it so yep. if you had a hundred constituents that were all clicking that that form email that's great but i'll tell you if you've just got a group of four or five of you that take a meeting with the senior staff in the office as a starting point ultimately the mp if you've educated that mp about the horrible conditions that animals are living through but most importantly given the crisis in which we live the one health approach and the and the danger and risk and and look this has already been examined by the chief medical officer in bc mm -hmm. it's examined by dozens of infectious disease experts who I referenced when I spoke in the House of Commons when I introduced the bill for the first time. So the work is there. The answer is obvious. It's more of an education effort that's required. And I guarantee there are dozens of colleagues from all parties who just have never turned their mind to this particular issue. And when they get the evidence, when they get the evidence from constituents who care, I guarantee that they will act on that if there's a vote in the House or if there's an opportunity to share information and share their support with the government. Awesome. And one thing I wanted to ask about and kind of end on is we'll hear from people when something like this comes up, policy to end something that we all want to see ended. And there is built in timelines of a year to do it or more sometimes. Or there's a conversation like this in which we say we may not accomplish what we want tomorrow, but it sets us up for next week nicely. And I think there can be a lot of disappointments or frustration around that which incidentally comes from a place of compassion because it is, I want this to end now, it's so terrible. In terms of managing that, both yourself as an MP uh, and yourself as an animal lover, do you have ways or, or tools that you would push people towards or recommend looking at of, I want it now, what can I do to sort of fill that gap of frustration through to knowing it's a bit of a long game? It's a really good question. I'm not sure I've got a really good answer. I would say that in part, I was raised vegetarian mm -hmm. and I'm now entirely plant-based, have been for many years and we're raising, my wife is a plant-based chef and we're raising our kids vegan and I'm not going to convince, I can't convince my brother to go, be, you know, I'm not going to convince everyone with the existing products that are in the marketplace at the moment, I'm not gonna be able to convince everyone to change their eating habits, despite the fact that I really want them to for the mm -hmm. sake of animals, for the sake of the environment. And I had someone ask me when I was introducing C246, when I first got elected around protecting animals and strengthening animal protections, well, why don't you just introduce a bill to ban meat? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah. do, you, do you want to be effective and do you wanna recognize the reality in which we live? And that's absurd. That's absurd that I would be able to accomplish something like that or, or would even seek to do something like that given the world in which we live and, and the neighbors that I live beside and just yep. the realities. And so I think people just have to take a step back and, and say, how do I do the most? How, how can I affect the greatest amount of change that I'm able to in light of those realities and just keep at it and just keep at it and just keep at it? And persistence matters that I can tell you when I started this, in October of 2015, I introduced the first piece of legislation on animals uh, early February 2016, and that bill failed. Mm -hmm. It was defeated. It was defeated by my own government, for God's sake. So was I disappointed? Yeah. Was I frustrated? Yeah. Was I really mad? Yeah. But circled back, pushed caucus colleagues who all 
basically said, not this bill, but Nate, we support the idea. We support doing more on animals. And out of that, we saw two pieces of government legislation that moved the needle. We saw a bill that came out of the Senate to prohibit cetaceans in captivity. That got supported by the government. We, As I mentioned, we've got four or five items from the platform all related to better protecting animals. And so we are we are on a path here where we're, where we're seeing progress and meaningful progress, I would say. And is it going to be an overnight endeavor? Obviously not. Obviously not. Like the, the amount of lobbying that I see on Parliament Hill by the meat and hunting mm -hmm. lobby groups is, is, is unreal, actually, when you think about it. And so are we going to see progress overnight? No. Are we going to see at some points prog some progress undone? Probably. And we just have to keep at it and know that we have the right answers when it comes to animal sentience, the fact that animals live, think, and feel, and love, and all of the science supports that core idea of compassion and respect. And we know that when we look at a One Health approach and the pandemic in which we live, that climate action is necessary, that reducing consumption of animal protein is necessary, that the, the trajectory that we are on, whether it is fur farming, whether it is industrial animal agriculture writ large, we are on an unsustainable trajectory that we need to change. And whether it's via innovation, whether it's via reducing consumption, whether it's operationalizing the food guide, whether it's banning commercial fur farming, whether it's strengthening animal protections via animal testing, there are all sorts of ways we are going to be able to make a positive difference. Some will be easier than others. And, and so we have to think of it in sort of short-term steps, medium-term steps, long-term steps, and different answers will be needed depending upon those steps. And honestly, we just have to keep at it and, and drive towards what we want. And we're gonna. It's not gonna be the easiest thing sometimes, and and that's okay. I, I I've I've experienced similar challenges around drug policy, right? Mm -hmm. Like we literally have policies on the books that are killing people. Prohibition is killing people. Yep. It's creating an un an unsafe drug supply that is killing people. And have we changed course yet? No. But have we made massive progress? Yes. And so I just sort of keep my head down and say we just have to keep at it. And in the role that I'm in, I'm gonna do everything I can to change these policies and do everything I can to advance things bit by bit in the incremental political world in which I live. And I guess to everyone out there listening, you don't see legal changes in parliament until you see social change. So actually the role that every listener has is crucially important to talk to their friends, talk to their neighbors, to talk to their elected representatives and affect that social change so we get the laws changed. To learn more about Bill C-247 or engage Nathaniel on other issues, visit baynate.ca. That's B for beaches, E for east, Y for york, and nate.ca. To utilize the Fur Bears one-click mail to your MP or find out how to contact federal officials to support this if you're outside of Canada, visit thefurbears.com. Links are available in the show notes. I want to thank everyone for listening and for your ongoing support, especially through this recent disruption to the episode flow as JJ and I settled into a new home. If you're ever curious as to what's going on with the podcast, what upcoming episodes might be, or just to see photos of JJ the Hamilton Hound and myself, follow me on Instagram at Howie Michael or Facebook via the Defender Radio podcast page. Remember to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Remember to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen and get email updates with contest offers and more at DefenderRadio.com. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bears, thanking you for your kindness. <laughs>